messy, but he has a very broad range of interests because he's worked on you know, many body systems and glaciers and climate change. And uh, most recently, uh, you know, he was also one of the first people uh, to start uh, analyzing questions of excess mortality. And uh, these are discussions, many of, uh, you know, many of these discussions, in fact, happened as part of the ISRC group. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he's again someone who's thought very deeply about uh, the issue, and he's going to then now present um, uh, these academic estimates that Rukmini alluded to. And after that, we'll have Prabhat. So uh, thank you, Shankar. Uh, you have 20 minutes, and uh, yeah. at about 18, I'll give you. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and that was a very nice in talk by Rukmini just now, where we sort of got the story of how this whole field developed and various issues that contribute to uh, uh, contribute to this undercounting. Uh, okay, so I'm sharing my screen now. Is it visible? Uh, yes, it's visible. Oh. So this presentation is uh, a joint presentation, actually, worked by Ganeshan, Raja Raman, uh, Srinivas Ramani, and myself. I'm R. Shankar. Um, so so uh, let me uh, i'll be talking mainly about the data itself um so this is the issue the current issue that started off this uh, uh, i mean that motivated this seminar and uh, started about a month ago when this uh, who report came so this is the paper where the details are available the supplementary data actually contains a lot of the details of the uh, what they used in india so basically, they said that in uh, according to their model, in 2020, there were about 4 to 13 lakh excess deaths uh, in India, most probably 8 lakhs. So these are the 95% confidence limits, and this is the mean. Increased a lot in 21, from 27 to 55 lakhs, and most probably about 13 lakhs. So this gives you an uh, estimate of the undercounting factor, that is, how much the uh, reports are undercounted by. And it's about five or so in the in 2020 and around 10 in 2021. Uh, sorry, 13 in 2021 and an average of 10. This was, uh, what do you call it, strongly denied by uh, representatives of the government of India. And here is a statement by Dr. V.K. Paul of the Niti Aayog that uh, deaths are not many times the reported figure. So they, they have not given their own estimate as far as I know, but uh, they are um, basically seem to be claiming that is not very much more than one, done, uh, that the government numbers are almost accurate. So we are not going to analyze and evaluate the WHO model, but we are just going to look at the data, stare at it, and sort of try to present what we have understood from the, uh, directly from the data. So first, I'll just, uh, at the uh, risk of boring everyone, re review some of the basic method, then give some of our results for Chennai and some of the eight states. Rukmini has already presented some of those Hindu uh, data. Then I'll talk about the civil registration system and the sample registration system. And finally, compare the results of the WHO model with, these, uh, with this data. So uh, as I said, at the risk of boring people, let me just define everything. So the all-cause mortality is simply the number of deaths due to all causes. The basic source of this data is the civil registration system. But as Rukmini said, there are other sources. Uh, the seawater, for example, with Prabhat will uh, probably be telling us about. And recently, I saw some paper based on life insurance claim. So uh, this is not the only source, but this is the basic source which WHO uses and large number of people use. Expected deaths is an estimation of the all-cause mortality during the pandemic if it had not happened. So what do we mean? The pandemic has happened and nobody can undo it. So basically, it's just a conceptual issue. It's just there in our heads. It is obtained by suitably extrapolating the all-cause mortality of the pre-pandemic years to the pandemic years. Of course, this can be done in many ways, and the devil is in the details, and I'll talk a little bit about it later. 
So the excess deaths is just the difference between the all-cause mortality during the pandemic period and the expected all-cause mortality that comes from extrapolating the data in the, the, from pre-pandemic. So undercounting factor, we are defining it as a ratio of the excess deaths to the reported COVID deaths. Now, if all the excess deaths are attributed to COVID, then the undercounting factor is the factor by which the reported uh, number of deaths undercount the actual number of deaths. So let me start by just giving you some feel for all these uh, uh, quantities that I've been talking about. Here's an overview of what happened in Chennai. That, so this is simply the uh, 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 directly plotted data. No, uh, no lines, no extrapolation, no smoothening, nothing. Uh, in the red is the all-cause mortality. And the scale for this is given on the left-hand side. The blue is the number of cases, all-cause mortality, daily all-cause mortality. The blue is the number of uh, cases detected uh, per day. And the scale is given in the right-hand side. And the purple is the number of deaths reported per day. And there's the same scale for that. Now, the scales are different because the number of all-cause mortalities are much larger than the others. So this is just to make it fit on the... So you can clearly see the three waves, the first wave or the alpha wave uh, in early uh, 2020, then the second wave or the delta wave, and early 2022, the third wave, which is the Omicron wave. Now you can see that the all-cause mortality peaks at the same time that the reported COVID deaths and the reported cases peak, roughly the same time. So when the COVID deaths go up, the all-cause mortality also goes up. So that sort of tells you that the all-cause mortality is a good way of monitoring the excess COVID deaths. The, it responds and it, it visibly responds, uh, discernibly responds. One interesting thing is that if you look at the first wave, the all-cause mortality actually peaks slightly before the, uh, uh, the, the, what do you call it, deaths and the cases. So it may have set in before testing really took, uh, you know, early January, uh, I mean, early in the uh, year, testing was very little. So I'm sure uh, many of the, maybe many of the cases went undetected. So this just sets, says that it, this is peaking somewhere slightly earlier than. Uh, uh, okay, so now let me talk about the baseline and how you extrapolate. And this is with respect to the Chennai data. So the blue is the Chennai data from uh, all cause mortality smoothened out. It's much noisier than uh, this one uh, from <clears throat> 2015 to 2019. There's a seasonality in the data, as you can see. There's a winter peak and a summer peak. These sizes vary year to year. Sometimes the winter is larger, sometimes the summer is larger. There's a huge winter peak in 2016, and there's a huge summer peak in 2019. Uh, you can also see there's a generally, apart from these fluctuations, there's a generally increasing trend. So then you can, define the baseline in various ways. Uh, this first one is the green one, which includes the effect of the trend. Uh, the second one is 2018-19 average. So you can see in the pandemic years, there is no trend in this data. And same with the five-year average data. Now, which is correct? It's not, uh, it's not easy to say simply by looking at mathematics and the fits. It depends on the process. Now, suppose this increase was just due to increase in registration and it became 100% registration uh, just before the pandemic. Then it doesn't make sense to include the trend. Then one of the simple averages is better. But suppose this trend is actually a real trend, say caused by <laughs> population rise, and we found the numbers consistent with population rise then that trend will continue in the next uh, few years also. Then the trend should be included. So mathematics alone is, uh, uh, this is general for extrapolating any data of, uh, from a physical process. Mathematics alone is not decided. One should have some knowledge about the process going on. 
some detailed knowledge coming from other sources uh, to help you decide which is the best. So based on this, these are our uh, results for Chennai um, um, from this excess debts. Um, so you can see that the choice of baseline makes a big difference. This five-year bit trend is 1.6 and five-year average is three and it's some, this thing is somewhere in the middle. Same uh, in all these cases. So uh, uh, in general, the undercounting factor was maximum for the second wave and uh, sort of, uh, for, I'm a bit surprised, but it seems minimum for the first wave, the maximum for the second wave, then dropped again a bit for the Omicron wave. Um, but all these undercounting factors are varying, you know, two, three, five, that type of uh, thing. So this is uh, the data for seven states uh, uh, produced by the Hind uh, Hindu team. Uh, so this is also based on CRS data obtained by RTI and various other means uh, from the, this thing. So uh, uh, again, these numbers were, uh, are higher in the second wave than the first wave. But in Tamil Nadu, it goes the other way around. Karnataka, it goes the other way around. In, <coughs> I shouldn't say first wave, second wave, 20 and 21. And uh, in these four, so there's no uh, fixed pattern. Typically, the undercounting is more for 21 and uh, sometimes drastically more like in Andhra Pradesh. But it, it reduces also. There are uh, states that are showing both trends. Now let me talk a little bit about the CRS and the SRS, the civil registration system and the sample registration system. These are the three uh, recent uh, bulletins put out by uh, these organizations. The, um, uh, this is the Census India and uh, this. There was also a recent article in the Hindu by one former member of this Office of Registration General who pointed out several inadequacies with the system. So civil registration system is simply <coughs> the agency that issues birth and death certificates and records all of them. The sample registration system is a system to try to check on this uh, CRS. So what they do is they take a small sample in each state, typically 1% or even less than 1% of the population, and then do a thorough job of uh, registering the deaths and uh, uh, births by door, periodic door-to-door -door enumeration, I mean, on the field. So they don't wait for people to report the uh, event, but go and uh, scan it. <laughs> and they have some kind of protocol to uh, uh, do this. Then assuming that the sample represents the whole state, uh, you can then uh, get an estimation of the level of registration, and that is one of the main one thing that this is used for. But it's a small sample, and as we all know, uh, a small sample, how well it represents a big uh, heterogeneous uh, sample, depends very crucially on how that small sample is chosen, and you can go wrong over there. So this is what I was talking about, the level of registration. This is a plot from the uh, CRS data. So you can say these are the registered deaths. They have been constantly increasing. Uh, this is from uh, 1989 to today. The death rate as estimated by SRS is constantly decreasing uh, from about seven, slightly, not very much, seven per thousand per year, uh, year to six per thousand per year. Now, so this increase is not because of increase in death rate. It is also too large to be because of the population rise. So it can be basically attributed to the uh, le uh, level of registration, that the fraction of people who are registration is, is increasing year by year. So the CRS defines what they call the level of registration as the total number of registered deaths into the CRS death rate into the population. So basically, they are assuming that the CRS, uh, SRS, sorry, SRS uh, sample gives a good representation for the uh, whole state. 
and they use that to define this level of registration. Now, when we were fooling around with the data, we noticed many inconsistencies with the CRS SRS, and this has been reported in the media also by several people. Um, so then we found a very clear way to show that SRS may be underestimating death rates. So let me give you the method first. Let us first define a quantity called the minimum death rate, which is the number of registered deaths per media population. Now, the number of actual deaths is always more than the number of registered deaths. At least it is equal, but if it's less than 100% uh, registration, number of registered deaths will always be, some actual deaths will always be more than number of registered deaths. So this, the number of actual, the actual death rate will always be more than this minimum death rate. Because this number is clearly an estimate, underestimate of the actual number. So then if you compare these two, <clears throat> if the SRS death rate is less than the minimum death rate, then the SRS is clearly underestimating the death rate. Whereas if the SRS death rate is greater than the minimum death rate, then no firm conclusion is possible. It could be either way. So here are data for some of the states that we plotted. Uh, this is Tamil Nadu, and I don't know how clear this is, but this is uh, blue, and this is the minimum death rate, and this is the green dots, and this is coming from the SRS death rate. This is the SRS death rate. So before 2014, SRS was greater than, I mean, the minimum was less than the SRS, a consistent, so nothing can be said. But after 2014, the two diverge, and the minimum death rate is much larger than the SRS death rate. Actually, by a factor of about 1.5, this is around 9, this is around 6. Similar pattern for Karnataka, where, uh, again, after about 2014-15, the minimum death, the SRS death rate estimated is much lower than the, uh, what should be the minimum uh, death rate. Again, in 2019, this factor is around 1.5. But this is not so for all the states. In Kerala, it was sort of roughly the same. Uh, it is being, uh, I mean, the death rate is being underestimated, but not by very much, and there is no trend. This is the Rajasthan data where nothing can be said because the minimum is less than the estimated. But it is still strange that this is coming down and this is going up, but nothing firm can be said. So to convert the may to be is, this analysis has to be done for all the states. And uh, we have not had the time uh, to do it so far. So now let me come to a very brief description of the WHO report, uh, the model that the WHO report is, WHO report is based on. So they do two things. They, they, to use the estimate the baseline of expected deaths, they use the CRS data from 2015 to 19. However, they adjust it to take into account the under-registration using some algorithm, but that algorithm takes an input from the SRS data. Then to estimate the all-cause mortality during the uh, pandemic period from the subnational uh, partial data available to them, that is subnational and with data gaps in time, they use a model. And they say that one of the central assumptions of this model is that the fraction of the deaths in every region as a you know, fraction to the uh, ratio of the deaths to every region to the national total should not change very much in time. Or the pop, uh, population within the region should not change very much over time. That means no large scale migrations, etc. So that is a sort of uh, condition for their uh, model to work. I have not gone through the details of the model, so I won't be able to shed much light on that. And this is the data they present about the fraction of the, the, the as they say, proportion of state all-cause mortality to the total Indian uh, mortality. Uh, so after the pandemic, they are assuming it to be flat. And before the pandemic, there are roughly flat. Some of the states, there are not too much fluctuations. This is UP. It has fairly large fluctuations. There's something else which has fluctuations. But this is the level, and I'm not able to judge 
uh, how flat these are, but this is the data they present. Now, the baseline of the WHO, uh, this is a figure in their paper. They, uh, this is from 2015 to 2019, and this is the all-cause mortality. It has only one peak per year, that is uh, all peaked around winter, unlike the Chennai data. Uh, now, uh, um, the colored things are the states for which they have uh, all-cause mortality data for the pandemic year all-cause mortality data, and these are the others. So, but this now here I have added uh, the CRS raw data from 2015 to 18. So you can see uh, this thing is almost flat. There's a very slight trend. This is rising and uh, this is significantly less than this. So this is the adjustment they have done to take into account the uh, under registration. Uh, so they have some algorithm based on the SRS data, and I don't know what that is, but uh, this is the uh, way they have adjusted. So to compare CRS data with the WHO data, one must uh, take into account this adjustment. So very empirically, we have just extracted this ratio of the WHO for 2019 to the CRS raw for 2019. And we'll use this ratio for uh, further purposes. Uh, assuming that this ratio doesn't change during the pandemic years, but they do say that they assume that the uh, completeness that they use or the LOR that they use uh, for the pandemic years is what they obtained in, the, uh, in 2019. Now, so here is the all-cause mortality from the uh, WHO model. Uh, this is 2000 up to 20, and this is uh, 21. So since CRS uh, data is only available for uh, 2020, we'll concentrate on that. So this blue is the average. These are all monthly uh, numbers. And so blue is the average of the WHO uh, model prediction. And uh, this, uh, what do you call it? Pink is the raw CRS data for 2020. So the WH, the numbers are that the WHO model is almost uh, uh, one crore uh, excess deaths. The CRS raw is 81 lakhs. And if I scale the CRS raw by that 1.17 factor empirically extracted from the baseline data, then you get uh, 94 lakhs or 90, roughly 95 lakhs. So this is still less than this. So uh, Final conclusion from all this is, firstly, SRS may be significantly underestimating death rates and needs to be reviewed, in our opinion. Um, one needs more work to uh, on this, but it definitely needs to be looked at in detail. So the current uh, level of registration may not be reliable. For example, the uh, result that the national level of registration in 2020 is very close to 100% is based on this SRS data, which may be getting underestimated, and therefore the LOR may be getting overestimated. So as we saw on the previous slide, the WHO model for all-cause mortality is larger than even the scaled uh, data, uh, CRS data, at least by one lakh, maybe by around five lakhs, somewhere uh, between this uh, number. Now, since there's been some discussion about states where the CRS data reduced during the pandemic period, which seems a bit anomalous um, as compared to 2019. So I've just uh, made a list, the cut and paste from the report of the states where these happened. So the largest is UP, uh, of course, but when you look at it as percentage of the total deaths, these are all roughly the same, not much to choose, about 7% of the total deaths is what it reduced by. Um, then they're all spread all around the country, the Northeast, uh, Jharkhand, uh, South, North, etc. They are the, the ruled by a variety of uh, political parties. So basically, I'm not able to see any pattern in this reduction, but clearly this uh, reduction is anomalous. 
and um, it has to be looked upon in detail that why it came and uh, is it a, a cause for the difference between the WHO model and the CRS. So finally, uh, who is right? Is uh, WHO right? Or uh, at the moment we feel who knows? However, that being said, we beg to disagree with uh, Dr. V.K. Paul. It, from all the above, it does seem clear that India's COVID-19 deaths are many times the reported figure. The open question is how many? Three, five, ten. That uh, probably some um, more work is required for. And uh, so I'll stop out here. Thank you for your attention. Uh Thank you very much, Shankar, for that uh, very clear and uh, pedagogical presentation. Uh, I think that was really helpful. I, I found it very helpful. I'm sure uh, everyone else uh, listening would also found it very helpful. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Prabhat Jha, uh, who's a global health expert uh, based in Toronto. Uh, so Prabhat was the lead author of a study uh, that was published in Science in January this year uh, that really, I think, put forward the first, uh, you know, really... Uh, uh, sharp and scientifically done estimate of excess mortality. And they estimated in this science article using CRS data and actually a very, very interesting sea water survey uh, that there had been 3.2 million deaths, uh, excess deaths uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, but I think Prabhat was also part uh, associated with the WHO report that finally estimated a higher figure. Uh, and uh, so I'm sure he is, you know, he's the ideal person to answer the questions uh, that Shankar had, and uh, we very much uh, look forward to your presentation. Uh, so please go ahead, Prabhat. The floor is yours. Uh, you're muted. Thank you very much. Let me quickly build upon um, the very good presentations from Rukmini and, and Shankar. And I'm going to start basically by giving you my conclusions, which are as follows, that what we have to understand is there was widespread household transmission in the first viral wave, and also particularly in the second viral wave, the first one being the original Aleph and the second one being mostly the Delta variant. Uh, the second viral wave did not uh, have any major protection as a result of the first viral wave. And as we've been discussing, the excess death proportions from COVID were at least twice that of the first wave with rural and air, urban areas also effective. And I think the key point here is a very simple one. How do you come up with an estimate that something like 2.4 million people died in excess during the second viral wave? This is the Delta wave of April, May, June of 2021. Well, very simply, if India has roughly eight lakh deaths a month on, from routine causes, and if you simply get a doubling of that for three months, you'll get 2.4 um, million deaths over the three months. And that's effectively what's happened. I think if you talk to anyone on the street, you don't need an epidemiologist. If you talk to people, uh, go down the street and ask during those three months, did you hear of deaths at least twice as often as you would have otherwise in your neighborhood? And the answer would be yes. So this is actually something we should ask the people of India to do their own studies. Just ask 10 neighbors what happened in their houses and you'd get pretty much the same answers as we're doing with more sophisticated results. So to collectively, we estimate <clears throat> conservatively that uh, between 2.7 to 3.4 million excess deaths um, arose, almost all of those were due to COVID. They weren't excess from other reasons. And as mentioned, there's significant undercount. And I think the key point here is when you tick these together, India is not remarkable um, versus other countries. The Indian death rates are actually quite consistent with those seen in Latin America, which uh, countries, or the US, which have much more complete death registration. So my last point would be, well, how do we move forward? I'll show you some evidence that uh, suggests that the Indian government, as they release more data, corroborates these estimates, uh, certainly for 2020. But moving forward, the definitive uh, answer to this would be 
for the Registrar General, Mr. Vivek Goshi, and the administration to put on the 2020 census, 2022 census, a simple question. Was there a death from January 1st, 2019 onwards? And if so, what was the age, sex, and date? And then you'd have a direct accounting of what happened during COVID. So you know all the, the uh, patterns of the Indian um, viral waves. So this is the first Aleph wave, and this was the very much the killer Delta wave. And you see this reflected in the deaths. And then an important story, however, has been India's remarkable increase in vaccines, which have very much attenuated a possible uh, third wave. So to start with, one of the things that we did earlier on is work with um, <clears throat> a private lab, um, ThyroCare, which had uh, testing data on about close to half a million um, self-referred patients. And we were looking particularly at seropositivity over time. And what was clear is in these self-selected populations surveyed nationwide, there was widespread prevalence of infection already. And you see this in the patterns. This is pre, um, excuse me, this should be uh, not 2002, this should be 2020 viral wave. Um, the patterns were that young children were infected and then this increased with age and attenuated. And if you look at the rate of increase, it was sharpest in the young adults. So all of this is very much consistent with widespread household transmission. And this, as we know, did not yield much protection against the 2020 viral wave. And part of the reason might well have been that um, the 2021 viral wave was characterized by what we, char what we note in um, biology as a very high viral load. And this is using a statistic, which is how many times do you have to crank the PCR machine to pick up the virus? And if you only have to crank it a few times, then there's means there's a lot more virus in the sample. And that's called the CT value. So the lower the CT value, the higher the viral load. And here you see on an inverted scale in the Delta wave, the CT values rose pretty quickly and were among the highest. They're also high during the Omicron wave, but we know Omicron didn't have much deaths. So this might be the other explanation that the second Delta wave had particularly high viral load at the population level. So to turn to the mortality, I mean, much of what I uh, will say has already been covered by um, Rukmini in particular, but let me just walk through these data and, and here's the key conclusions. First, COVID was the main contributor to the excess of deaths in the pandemic months. The overall COVID death rates are vastly underestimated. That's already been raised. And in fact, Indian COVID death rates are not remarkable. They're basically similar to other countries that have uh, far more complete registration. The starting problem, of course, as uh, Rukmini outlined, is deaths in India are, uh, there's large gaps in registration. Um, of the 10 million deaths that occur a year in India, it's not 8 million as the Indian government will show, it's, it's 10 million based on careful demographic work done by the UN. Uh, roughly 3 million are unregistered and roughly uh, over 7 million simply don't have a medical certification of death. And that's actually quite variable by state. And it's also greater in women than in men. <clears throat> so. In response to this and the delay in producing the sample registration system, we worked with Yashwant Desmukh and C Voter, who has a random digit dialing, which is computer assisted telephone company. And he took his company offline during COVID to be able to work from home. So they kept going where other polling companies could not. And they used random digit dialing of mobile phones, which as we all know has reasonably high coverage in India. And it selected quite a good distributed sample, which is important for statistical purposes. You, it was drawn from 4,000 local electoral areas. And the main study is we've focused on is 140,000 adults surveyed over time asking about deaths. But the question on household deaths was a bit imprecise. So we did a sub-study of 57,000 
adults with more exact definition of household debts versus uh, possible debts in the household or in, uh, in neighbors. And here's the key results. So this is a bit of a busy graph. So let me just explain it. So in the red are the household reports of any death, any COVID death that occurred over time. And you'll see in September, October of 2020, there was a peak reaching about 1.2%. But, and for other years, other months, it fluctuated. In the blue background are the official deaths reported by the government and the time cycle, as I showed earlier. And um, in the dotted black is the expected deaths with some seasonality incorporated using the million death study data in India. And the key conclusion is here is, okay, if on average you'd expect about 3% of houses in India to report a death, and during the COVID, the first peak, uh, that was 1.2%. So still far short of the overall totals of expected deaths. But during the second peak, you see that the houses reporting a COVID deaths exceeded what would be a, a reported for overall deaths. And the overall average, if you take this time period, it was 3.7%, but you see it peaks up to 5 or 7%. Five or six percent during uh, particular weeks. So, in the sub study, we asked a more direct question who's alive in 2019? Who died since? And we're simply looking at the death rates. So, if we compare in 2019, the all cause death rate was seven. The UN estimate, which is the more reliable one, was 8.1, and the sample registration system was 6.2. So, very comparable. And here you see what happened. Well, it rose by about 30% or so, 40% uh, in 2020, but more than doubled by 2021. And when we look at whether houses reported these as COVID deaths or non-COVID deaths, you see, interestingly, in the pre-pandemic period, um, there was basically, of course, no COVID deaths reported, but in 2020, the excess was reported in non-COVID deaths, interestingly, more than COVID deaths. Whereas in 2021, you saw an excess both in COVID deaths and non-COVID deaths. So this very much suggests that the main excess is in all deaths, that we know that COVID doesn't just kill through respiratory infection, but can kill through stroke or blood clots or other, uh, other mechanisms. And these data very much corroborate the overall results. And the key point there is there's at least a doubling of overall death rates for three months. Then the second source of data, as Rukmini mentioned, was the government's own health management information system covering mostly rural facilities, two lakh rural facilities. And here you see the same patterns versus the uh, earlier baseline of 2018-19, which is in the gray. There was a modest excess in 2020 but a huge excess shown in the blue in 2021. And when we looked at this separate for urban and rural, what you see is in the urban areas, there was an excess in 2020, but not in the rural areas in 2020. But in 2021, shown in the yellow, there was an excess both in urban and in rural areas of these facilities. And thanks to Ariel Karlinski and others, now we have the facility level data right through the end of 2021 and it corroborates that same pattern with a big spike, particularly in, in uh, uh, April, May, June for India and in hard hit states like Maharashtra, very similar patterns. So this is a summary of the three studies uh, designs that we've looked, I focused on the national sample and so roughly the excess percentage is 30%. So if 10 million deaths occur in India a year, 30% excess is 3 million. The facility level data give you 27% excess. And then the civil registration system, which we used only data on 10 states that had more than 10 months of observations. And we also corrected for under registration shows 26% excess. So very similar results across the three. Now, these are the WHO estimates. As mentioned, their global uh, estimate was 15 million excess deaths versus 6 million officially reported. 
And a large part of that 9 million difference occurred in India. Roughly half of the missing deaths were occurred in India. So India, by their estimates, are 4.7 million excess versus 0.5 million official. Now, I should say I had a role in reviewing these results, but was not a producer of them. Um, but I do believe that they're credible because what they effectively did is use the civil registration data for 17 states. So they used more states than we did. And um, they not just civil registration data, but they've used reports, daily counts of death reports from the states, um, which are the official numbers, and they've calculated excess mortality uh, using quite conservative principles. Uh, their models have worked well for places like Italy, and they've recognized they've not worked so well for places like Germany for the reason Schunker said they got the denominators of earlier deaths wrong, but now they've corrected those. So what's happened since? Well, first, uh, effectively, uh, as more data come out, particularly from the government of India, they in fact corroborate the estimates and I'll show you just for 2020, because we don't have estimates for 2022, uh, 2021, yes. But first, the important point is India does not have 8.3 million annual deaths as the government of India claims. That's based on the sample registration system, which independent demographic reviews have shown has undercounts, particularly in adults and particularly in women. So the UN population division has careful demographic estimates that suggest India has had 10 million annual deaths. And that's been quite stable over the last decade. Death rates are falling, but population growth is increasing. And you average out, and India has had pretty much 10 million deaths every year since about 2010 onwards. The civil registration data, therefore, covers 71% um, of all deaths, not 95%, as claimed by the government of India. And that's corroborated by the National Family Health Survey, which directly asked, was the death registered and found 71% of deaths were registered, not 95. Now, what did the CRS report show that the government very um, happily released? Well, if you look at their own numbers and take the average of 2018-19 as a baseline, that showed 7.3 million deaths. And you compare it to 2020, it's 8.12 million or 11% excess or roughly 0.83 million absolute excess. Our data from C voter uh, in science, which is this table here, look at this value of 8.6% for just a few months in 2020 showed a 9% excess, but only for eight months. The WHO estimate, for 2020 shows a 9% excess or 0.8. So in fact, the CRS data corroborate the WHO estimates. More recently, the Indian government has released the medically certified causes of death. Um, and this covers only urban hospitals and only about 20% of all of the national deaths. And what does this show? Well, the COVID proportion, just the COVID proportion with the limitations that COVID was underreported in medical certifications uh, because of too stringent a criteria, shows 9%. And that's the same proportion that we've shown and the same proportion as WHO's. If you look at a place that was harder hit like Maharashtra, it shows 18%. And that's consistent with a much bigger wave. Interestingly, just the absolute MCCD deaths in 2020 are 160,000, which is greater than the confirmed COVID deaths nationally of 150,000. But note, this only covers 20% of the population and not, this is supposed to cover the 150, the whole of the country. And as mentioned recently, there's a life insurance paper under uh, in uh, EPW that suggests there were about 3 million claims for COVID and it estimates using some indirect methods about 4 million additional deaths in 2020. So these are all consistent. Um, and the point here is that a, a big excess in deaths is not remarkable. This is Peru, which has had good reporting. And here you see the baseline of 2017-19 in blue. And then look at what happened in 2020 COVID deaths. 
for those certain weeks that far more than doubled. You can see this in the deaths per week. And this is a scale of 2000 and goes up to 6000. In fact, it tripled for that time period. Peru's had among the highest COVID death rates. So this is unremarkable that you would expect this kind of an increase. So what are the conclusions? COVID was the main contributor uh, to the big peak in excess mortality. The actual death rates are vastly underestimated, but uh, consistent with other, uh, other Latin American or even the US, uh, uh, US settings. So what's next in estimation? Well, as mentioned, I think the key is to add uh, and for us to try to keep lobbying the Registrar General to add a question. It's a simple question that can be added using the existing forms. Was there a death in this household from January 2019 onwards? If so, what was the date, age, and sex? That would give you direct evidence on uh, excess mortality. You don't need to know the cause. You just need to know, was there a death, yes or no? We can examine, we are examining excess cause specific mortality using the HMIS and then working with the CMIE will have reports on uh, cause specific mortality. Now, importantly, these data are, you think, well, the dead are pretty useless or um, to, to anyone. They're of interest to epidemiologists, but the key thing here is getting good mortality data will be essential to understand the differential impact of an overall very successful vaccine campaign. And going forward, understanding the variation in local mortality would be key to understanding future waves. So now much of the past attention has been focused on India, but we should not lose sight that the current challenge in 2022 is China, which faces a, a large Omicron wave and has hundreds, perhaps 100 million unvaccinated <clears throat> or under-vaccinated elder people above age 80, which in the case of Hong Kong led to a huge increase in spikes, very short term, but Omicron is not innocuous, it does kill. And if that's the case, then the major contribution to COVID deaths in 2022 might be from China, perhaps exceeding a, a million. So let me conclude again, the first wave characterized widespread household transmission, but with little protection against the second. The second wave had a uh, plausible more than doubling of all cause death rates for a limited time period. And those two simple things would explain the very large excess of deaths. So I, I, for example, don't know why the Indian government has dug in on saying we got the estimates wrong. It's very simple observations that would tell you that no, there was vast undercounting. And I do uh, say that the important thing is to try to get a question on the 2022 census. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that very clear presentation. Uh, so I think the YouTube streaming unfortunately didn't work, but there's some questions uh, which you think I sent me. Uh, so I'll just read them out from the chat and uh, the panelists can answer them. Also, if you have additional comments on the presentations made by other panelists, uh, you know, feel free to do that. Uh, so the plan is roughly to have about 15 or 20 minutes of discussion. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's informal. So, so please jump in if you feel the need to. Uh, so I'll start with the first question, uh, which is, I guess, a question to Shankar, uh, which is how is the minimum death rate calculated or estimated? Uh, because that's a phrase that you introduced. Uh, so Shankar, are you there? And you would you like to explain yeah, that again? Yeah, yeah. So no, it's very simple. It's just the... Uh, actual number of registered deaths divided by population. Why I'm calling it minimum is that the, uh, uh, sorry, not actual, the number of registered deaths divided by population. Why I'm calling it minimum is that the actual number of deaths will be larger than the number of registered deaths. So this is, the death rate is at least this much. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, then there's a question uh, specifically for Prabhat Jha, which is, uh, what is the correlation factor between sea water data and the government of India data for monthly deaths uh, during the period? I mean, are those well correlated? or? Oh, highly. Yeah, they were about 90% correlated. And you look at the graphs and they have a very high correlation. So um, the now the the concern was that is it just houses reporting what they're seeing in the media? 
so therefore they're reporting because they hear about it. It's, so you have this social desirability bias. But the subsidy of 57,000 addressed that directly by asking, did you have deaths in this household and who was alive in January 2019? And that showed a remarkable consistency of the excess in the second viral wave versus the main C voter. So if everything is pointing in one direction and you put together all of the studies, which are in the appendix of our science paper, and they all point to a substantial undercount between seven to 10 million, uh, seven to 10 fold, then I think there's very little uh, scientific uncertainty. It's just the political unwillingness of the Indian government to accept these numbers. Um, and I think, well, uh, my challenge is, well, if they don't accept them, then use the main instrument that you have, which is the census, to answer it. And if the census shows from a direct estimate that um, deaths actually are far modest, then scientists like myself will change our estimates. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, there's an additional question, which is, I think, a general question, which is, uh, uh, you know, how does how do deaths due to COVID compare with deaths due to diabetes and to that maybe one could add other diseases like maybe tuberculosis and so on? Uh, maybe if you could give the viewers a sense of that. Well, you want to uh, remember these, the COVID deaths are, first of all, caused not just through respiratory infection, but as we've learned more, um, particularly in... Uh, from chronic diseases. And this might be the reason why the death rates in men from COVID were greater than in women, simply because they have higher prevalence of chronic disease risk factors. So COVID can kill from a uh, stroke, from acute heart attack, from blood clots, from pulmonary embolus, and from renal failure. Those have all been described. So the we're working through the cause-specific data. So now, these are dramatic deaths, meaning they're intense increases concentrated over short time periods. But you do have to look at the overall patterns. Uh, so if you say of the 10 million deaths a year that occur in India, how many are attributable to smoking? Well, that's a million, but that's a steady pattern over many years. Um, during the course of the pandemic, yes, COVID has killed uh, perhaps twice as many as has been killed from smoking. If roughly it's a million a year, that's two million. And COVID has killed perhaps uh, three to four million. But that's during the acute period. In the chronic, uh, in, in the longer term, yes, the routine causes will be important. Uh, so maybe I can jump in with a question I, I had also for Shankar. Uh, and maybe this is also related to the, the other estimates that you mentioned. Uh, so Shankar, at some point in discussing the Chennai data, you said, you know, depending on how one extrapolated, whether one took into account the trend or not, uh, you know, you'd get a, you'd get a different, uh, you'd get a different figure for the excess deaths. I mean, does it even matter when you take the trend, how you interpolate, does it make a difference if you use linear interpolation versus some other way of estimating the trend? My, I, I thought just looking at it, that even that might matter. Even the question. Uh, yes, it yes it will. Uh, whether you, uh, uh, but I have no idea how much because I haven't done other uh, uh, extrapolation. For example, WHO says they use uh, what they call a spline, uh, some uh, solid spline or something, uh, which allows for deviation from linearity but discourages curvature. Uh, so there are. Uh, 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 every method will give us different answer, but how much they differ, uh, I really don't have any experience. I would just jump in here, and I think, I mean, I, I welcome Shankar's uh, um, efforts to try to get at the SRS undercounts. Uh, I mostly defer to the careful demographic work done by the UN, which uses internal life table estimates using population structure and there are a variety of demographic techniques that have been applied to India that confirm that the SRS does undercount deaths, but it does not do so at the levels that you've shown. Um, you know, the estimates are perhaps it's 20 to 30% undercount. It changes over time, but 20 to 30% overcount, not a sevenfold undercount in particular years. I think that would be so large 
that effectively the SRS system would be need to be invalid. And when we've looked at the SRS death rates and the distributions and the birth rates across various time periods, most people have said that despite its flaws, it's a pretty good stable system. So I think the undercounts are closer to 30% on average over the time period, not, not, uh, not much larger. Yes, so uh, as I said, we have done it only for these two states. Yeah. So one needs to do it for all of them to get some idea of the overall uh, under. But uh, wasn't your figure 1.17, Shankar? I thought you said 1.17. So it was 17% was your estimate, I thought. No, no. 1.17 uh, was the ratio of the raw CRS data to the uh, WHO uh, uh, correction. I see. I see. So that is the amount of the WHO correction in the uh, in 2019. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, there's a question for uh, uh, Rukmini, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, has the Indian media learned from the undercounting and is there any systematic attempt towards improving reporting in the future? So I think that the Indian media actually did, you know, a relatively good job on this, both uh, uh, both in terms of sort of raising early red flags that something was wrong. And I think those were very important, you know, even though they weren't sort of empirical estimates coming from, say, cities, municipalities in Gujarat, for example, uh, raising a clear alarm that there was this big mismatch was, was very important reporting done on the ground. Um, there's a couple of things that need to change more systematically, which I'm not sure if that's happening yet. One is that uh, this is an opportunity for everyone in the media to think about uh, all of the flaws in uh, estimation of deaths from various diseases, um, why that happens and how to do a better job of reporting on it, particularly deaths, within, deaths in rural areas and those uh, happening within private facilities. And I don't think that there's been a systematic way of figuring out how, how to change that. One sort of hope that I have is that sometimes there, um, well, there's, sometimes there's sort of reverence shown for official sources. And sometimes there's a sense that, that there's no alternative. That, you know, what are you as an individual journalist going to do in terms of estimating deaths when there's something like a CRS? You know, you just have to wait till it comes out. And I hope this sort of uh, attempt to, you know, to be investigative and also innovative in figuring out how to get data in the absence of, of it, I hope that will, that spirit will carry through not just for reporting on health, but on other things as well, which is uh, the government refusing to part with data cannot be a reason to stop reporting. And let's think about other ways, particularly at the state level to do that. Let's also engage more clearly. Uh, let's also engage much more with whistleblowers who do do continue to exist. And finally, I think the the uh, you know the flow between reporters on the ground who weren't necessarily doing empirical work, data journalists, and then academia, uh, particularly in the sciences, has been a very uh, rewarding collaboration. So hopefully, that is something that we can make more systematic for the future. <clears throat> Um, maybe I could add a question to that related to something you said. Uh, so without in any way, you know, compromising your sources, asking you about them, uh, since you spoke about whistleblowers, my understanding was that in the initial reports that you did, that was data that was leaked to you. So could you say a little bit about your journalistic experience just in, you know, reporting about that or how you, you know, got that data and, and you know, what, what uh, that, that might just be something which is useful. Sure. I think, uh... You know, wherever there is decentralized data, the number of sources just increase exponentially and that becomes a much more promising source, particularly in the case where uh, data is centrally held under ministries like the home ministry that are particularly hard for journalists to report on, which is the case with the uh, CRS, for example, the fact that it's under the home ministry makes things particularly hard. So, um, you know, I do believe that there was a very strong sort of public spirited feeling around and after the second wave that really came as a result of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sheer sort of 
shock and outrage at what was going on and a desire to do something more structured and systematic to to expose this so um it it really uh, there was a sort of constructive what can we do sort of constructive feeling across uh, experienced by many people which is why i think whistleblowers or people who were keen to help within some state governments and local administrations came forward it was just the scale was sort of you know um unbearable for people and, and in the face of numbers that were really um minimizing what people were going through um so essentially what that needed was access to state level portals of course the downside of all of this is that it you know we aren't creating systematic pathways for the future we were able to get this limited access at various state levels and then after the reporting was done that access was promptly closed so with the nhm for example which prabhat ja has used uh, so well in the science paper uh, i have had a play that is sort of cat and mouse game with the government for the last two years over it i first used the nhm to report on um, disruptions to routine healthcare because you know after the first lockdown it became very apparent from conversations with people and with doctors that there was a huge disruption in routine healthcare services and i wanted to try to quantify that so i looked at things like inpatient and outpatient uh, you know numbers from the nhm after i reported it it was pulled offline they stopped uh, it was pulled offline then i re- reported on it again after 3 months when the numbers came back it was pulled offline again then the numbers were available consistently through the second wave and when i did this reporting on mortality and then those numbers were also used um, independently by prabhat cha uh, to write the science paper the nhm has been taken offline since may 2021 and you know there's um, not a um, murmur of uh, opposition or uh, protest about the fact that this data that belongs to us that is about 2 lakh um, rural healthcare facilities across the country has been pulled offline and just not made available because it was used to produce these mortality estimates so uh, there there are all these silver linings but you know the more we find work arounds and sort of bootstrap solutions my fear is the, the greater we the more you know we sort of lower democratic pressure on the systems that do exist to do their job so if we do these work arounds and then we find someone else who's going to leak nhm data to us where does that pressure on the government to just release data that's been there for the last few decades and is ours by right uh, where does that pressure go so that that's something to consider um thank you uh so i had there's a question uh, in the chat which is uh now the number of studies larger than 10 studies showing very large excess death numbers uh so the question is about the government's own response uh, is there any study or estimate apart from the release of the crs data uh, that the government has done and the question is also has this been done in other countries i mean how does the indian government's response to this compare with that of other countries and given that you know this excess data will show up in insurance claims in fact there was discussion of the epw paper recently uh, and it cannot be hidden uh, you know how do you how do you anticipate the government uh, sticking on to its position if i'm well so i think anyone the, can the, take that yeah, yeah yeah the government has issued a effectively a press release that rebutted the who's or tried to rebut the who's points and they earlier had a press release uh, that dismissed our science findings as well but basically they've just been denials and not a counter estimate uh, there have been some attempts at uh, putting this together but as shown in my slide each time the government says ah you got it wrong here's our data you look carefully at the data and they say no we didn't get it wrong and at least for 2020 then estimates seem to corroborate i think the 2021 srs report will be the key and uh if that can be restarted remember what happens is the srs um does effectively cease operations before a census so as they were getting for administrative reasons there's nothing nefarious about it but they're um they have to train the more than 4 million census workers so all the srs staff are busy on those tasks so effectively from 2019 to 20 or so srs operations slow down 
um, and then they focus on the census. Now, the census was delayed, uh, so the hope would be if this is a window, then the sample registration system would restart. And now the question is an obvious one. Will those numbers get, um, get uh, basically a whitewash when they come up to Delhi? Well, um, you have to be really, really clever in a way to hide numbers that will uh, survive the scrutiny of so many demographers looking at it. So I actually have faith that the SRS results will be meaningful. There's some problems with them now because of COVID and the disruptions, but they, sh they should be brought, uh, brought forward. So I think that's the, the Indian government knows that it's got an underestimate but they've locked themselves into this position where they've just said, you know, I'm going to deny, deny, deny. And that's just a political decision. I think the scientists who are very credible within the government of India very much know that it's not an, un it's an untenable position. They just don't have any political way to, to get out of it. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think that's clear, but let me just sharpen that question a little bit with respect to the 2020 data, which is, uh, you know, soon after the WHO estimate came out, the uh, government immediately released the 2020 CRS data. So their argument, and if you could respond to that for viewers, it would be very helpful, is that if one does some simple linear interpolation using the 2018 and 19 data, which shows increase in CRS, then one would find that, you know, there weren't that many excess deaths in 2020. So if one assumes that the trend in registration has been going up the way it was in 2018 and 19, then that would falsify the WHO estimate. Uh, that's what I understood the government's argument to be. So if you could just, I know you gave a lot of details, but if one of you could just quickly explain why that's uh, incorrect or correct, that would be very helpful, I think, for those who are watching. Well, they were cherry picking. They only compared it against the 2019 uh, whereas the appropriate standard, because there's year to year variation, and it would be to look at the average of 2018 or 19. And when you do that, which is what I did in the, in the slides, and I tweeted it as well, you get a 9% excess or 11% excess, which is very similar to the WHO estimate and to the independent C voter national polling results. So the 2020 CRS results actually corroborate and not refute the WHO and our estimates. The medically certified cause of death data do the same. They actually are closer to the, the estimates from WHO and ours than they are to the, w, to the government of India's estimates. Uh, just to sharpen that a little bit, I mean, the, sorry. Should Sudan, can I also, sorry, uh, just another point I want to make, which is that um, uh, this relies on the assumption that uh, registration was not interrupted or affected in 2021. And there is now some evidence, sorry, in 2020, and there is now some evidence that uh, registration was affected in 2020. This comes, for example, from the NFHS, which was conducted because of the pandemic split into 19 and 21. And in 21, they were able to ask people about if they had a death in the family, which year the death was and whether it was registered. And it does show that uh, compared to deaths registered in 2019, uh, there was a decline in registrations in 2020. It also is a fact that taken at face value, the levels of registrations are just uh, defy explanation in some states because taken at face value, Uttar Pradesh, for example, would have shown a huge unexplained drop in registered deaths in 2020. So it's one thing to argue that that the, you know, that the increase could be explained by an improvement in registration. It's another thing to try and explain why you're seeing a huge decline in mortality if you're assuming that registrations are accurate. So just as I would argue that we don't know that registrations uh, decline for sure in 2020, we also don't know for sure that they improved. And knowing what we know about um, you know, uh, administration, administrative systems being overwhelmed, there's good reason to worry that uh, registrations did decline in 2020. Shankar, do you have anything to add about that since you had some calculations specifically about that? Or... Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, registration must have, uh, the, according to the SRS, it remained constant after uh, 2019, the death rates. But uh, I think the fact that in many states, the 
registrations went down shows that there is a problem with the system and there was probably under registration in many uh, cases. Uh, I mean, it, it rose very sharply after 2018. 2018 to 2019, there was a big jump and then the same trend carried on to, uh, to 2020. So I think there is defi uh, definitely reason to think that the uh, registration, level of registration went down in uh, 2020. Uh, okay, so the last question, uh, the last question is, uh, you know, maybe doesn't have a clear answer, but it's it's a YouTube question. Uh, so the question is, you know, of the excess debt estimates, is there a way to understand uh, how many of them were due to COVID or how many of them may have occurred due to, uh, you know, uh, just lack of access to healthcare due to the lockdown and, you know, maybe even some positive impacts of the lockdown, such as reduction in traffic accidents, which might have counted the other way. So. I mean, is there is there uh, some way of trying to make that accurate using current or maybe future data? So all, all the panelists, anyone would like to jump in? We, I think those are important questions, but we're studying them right now using both the HMIS data and as mentioned, a new survey with the CMIE, which is a nationally representative survey of about uh, over 20,000 deaths. So that'll cover the exact COVID period. And yes, some things did go down, but just to give you a snapshot for the HMIS, what happened is admissions fell uh, and they did not come back up. This is during the lockdown of 2020. Um, and then they did not come back up to the earlier levels. But when you look at the excess of uh, deaths, you see it right across a range of conditions, not just what was reported as respiratory infections or fever-related deaths, but you see it in the conditions that could be linked to COVID. Conditions that are not linked to COVID, for example, tuberculosis or, uh, or uh, some cancers didn't uh, change much, but all, many of the other conditions did. And clearly there would be an impact of um, the just fewer people going to rural hospitals on the outcome. So I think that's part of the job of the sample registration system is going forward is to try to characterize what happened uh, because of the disruption in the healthcare system. So I think those are ongoing studies uh, that will have better evidence in probably a few months. Uh, in, the, in the Chennai data, uh, <laughs> actually between the waves, uh, the ACM actually fell below the baseline. Uh, Rukmini had pointed this out in her first uh, article, and we had also seen this uh, when we wrote that. And uh, now, uh, so that's a lockdown effect, but what exactly? So traffic accidents are often quoted as one source. They are definitely our one source. But we dug out the traffic fatalities data from the Chennai, uh, this thing. And they weren't enough. Uh, while they definitely co contributed a fraction, they were not enough. So that remained a puzzle for us. We don't know. But between the waves, it did look like the, uh, well, maybe because of lockdown or whatever, the excess deaths became negative. You want to add something, Rukmini, or last words for anyone? Not me on this, uh, because I don't yet know about causes, as Dr. Jha says, hopefully we'll know going forward. Okay, um, okay so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to all the three panelists for their extremely erudite presentations and for answering the questions. Uh, I'm sure this was very helpful. I, I certainly found it very helpful, and I'm sure everyone who was uh, watching found it very helpful. Thanks, uh, as always, to Jam and uh, Ritika for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful event, which is uh, really a, such an important resource. And uh, I so, so would like to thank all the panelists and so that uh, moderating as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.